Hello everyone. In this episode, we're going to take a close look at the most widely used, well-founded measure for multidimensional poverty. This is known as the Multidimensional Poverty Index, or MPI, which is calculated each year for as many countries for, as data can be found, well over 100, by the United Nations Development Program. And it presents these measures and outcomes in the Human Development Report, the same report at which it presents every year the new data on the Human Development Index. So whenever thinking about poverty, we always first look at the identification of who is poor. This is essential because of the focus principle. A measure of poverty must focus on those who are poor. And this applies for multidimensional poverty analysis every bit as much as it does for income poverty analysis. So first, there's cutoff levels within each dimension, just as specifically with the income dimension for income poverty, we had a poverty line such as $1.25 or $1.90, and those whose incomes fell below that line were identified and then focused on as being those who are poor. We have something similar to that here. For the most part, specifically within the MPI, there aren't data to have continuous variables like income, so as a result, there's a deprivation indicator given of one if the person is deprived, therefore they're identified as being deprived in that dimension or that indicator, zero if they're not. But second, there's a cutoff in the number of dimensions in which a person has to be deprived in order to be deemed multidimensionally poor. Usually, it's not enough to be deprived in just one indicator for the conclusion that the person is multidimensionally poor. And we'll see an example or two of that. So that the MPI then specifically in doing this focuses on three sets of deprivations. One is the indicators in the health dimension, one in the education dimension, and one in standard of living. Standard of living you can think of as broadly like the different standards of living that we looked at around the world when we examined in the first chapter a comparison of living levels in different countries around the world and for families more specifically. And so each of these three gets equal weight and that means in particular that one-third of the overall poverty deprivation weight goes to deprivations in health, a third in education, and a third in standards of living. So the current MPI indicators in each of these dimensions are first of all health. For health there are two indicators. Each of them has equal weight. So in each case we're looking at people living in a family. The first one says, has any child died in this family? If so, the people living in that family are determined to be deemed as poor in that indicator. So there's two indicators with equal weight. So if this is the case for the people in that family, they are now one-sixth deprived overall. The second is whether any adult or child in the family is malnourished. If that's the case, then people in the family are determined to be multidimensionally deprived in that indicator. Second is education. For education, we also have two indicators within that dimension. Each of them have equal weight, again, one-third overall weight in the index to education, so each of these two indicators then has one-sixth of overall weight in the education part of the MPI. And these two are whether no household member has completed five or more years of schooling. And the other is whether there's any school-aged child who is out of school for grades one through eight. So taken together, these are our education indicators. With respect to standard of living, there are six indicators that are used. And so since each of these has one third weight, that means that for each of these six areas, if you're deprived in one, that gives you one 18th deprivation overall. And you could see that some of these are fairly straightforward. Lack of electricity, that's a problem for many parts of living, but they relate to some of these other indicators. 
Lack of electricity means, for example, that a child doesn't have light to be able to do homework at night. Insufficiently safe drinking water, inadequate sanitation, inadequate flooring, unimproved cook, uh, cooking fuel, all of these represent poverty conditions in themselves. All of those, by the way, also have negative implications for health. For example, unimproved cooking fuel means you may very well suffer from indoor air pollution. Inadequate flooring, you may have parasites coming into the house. Inadequate sanitation and drinking water have clear implications for poor health. Then, going beyond this, we have finally the lack of more than one out of the following five assets. Telephone, such as a cell phone, radio, TV, bicycle, and motorbike. So that if you're only lacking in one of these, you don't, you're not deprived in that area. But if you're lacking in two or more, you are. By the way, if you don't have a motorbike, but, but do have a car, as you can imagine, you're not deemed deprived in that area. You can see that to a significant degree, a radio and a TV might be substitutes because of the fact that you can get information from either one and also that a bicycle and a motorbike might be to a degree substitutes. But if you're lacking two or more of these, then you're considered to be lacking and deprived in this asset class for another one eighteenth overall of deprivation. So then the question is, do these indicators interact or are they to a degree substitutes? So building the index as we're doing here up from the household measures to the aggregate measure, rather than taking already averages in each of the deprivations and then averaging the averages together, the MPI approach is able to take account of possible interactions between deprivations a kind of complementarity when there's multiple deprivations experienced by the same individual or family. If you take averages of averages, you don't know whether the deprivations you found are spread more or less evenly around people in the society or whether they're concentrated in particularly multidimensionally provide, uh, deprived uh, families. So that the MPI approach assumes that the lack of capability in one area can to some extent be made up by substitution. To the extent that you're somewhat health deprived, it's possible that you can retain your capabilities through using some combination of your assets on the one hand and your education on the other. But up to some point only, beyond that point, you cannot do that. And in fact, these different deprivations can become mutually reinforcing which is kind of what I was getting at before about how some of those asset deprivations had also implications for education or health deprivations. So then how do we compute the MPI? Well, there's a very convenient way to express it that I like very much as a way of explaining this, which is the product of the headcount ratio H. This H is the fraction of those who are multidimensionally deprived and or times A, which is the average intensity of deprivation. That is to say, we take only those who are multidimensionally poor. Just among those, what fraction of indicators for them are they deprived in? And so if you multiply the two together, you get what's called the adjusted headcount ratio, which is the headcount ratio H, the fraction who are multidimensionally poor, times the average amount by which they're deprived. The indicator that we have, the MPI, adjusted headcount ratio, satisfies some desirable properties, anonymity and so on. An important example something that we have not encountered before, is dimensional monotonicity. It's analogous to income monotonicity when we looked at our poverty, income poverty measures such as P2. It says if you take a person who's already identified as poor because they have some 
above threshold fraction of poverty indicators, they then become deprived in another indicator than she's measured as being even poorer than before. This is not the case with a simple headcount ratio. Suppose the cutoff is 30% or 0.3, as it is within the multidimensional poverty index. So if you have a person who's deprived in 60% of the indicators, they are therefore considered to be multidimensionally poor. Now, if you're just looking at the fraction who are multidimensionally poor, if that person becomes deprived in 70% of the indicators, that does not show up in the index. It's the same kind of problem that we had to address when we were looking at income poverty before, or similar problem, but in a multidimensional framework or aspect of multidimensional poverty. And so, uh, just before I made this recording, I decided I should probably use an example. So I made up an example. I don't know why I never thought of this example before because it's the simplest one I could think of. And so in this case, we're going to have three people and three dimensions. And the dimensions will be health, wealth, if you want, and education. That is to say, we have our health dimension as we measured it before. This wealth refers to standard of living and education for E. Now remember our simple way of writing this down. If we deem an individual to be deprived, they get a one. Otherwise, they get a zero. So based upon the methods and indicators, we're going to just assume that we have one for each of these variables. We're going to assume the following for these three people. The first person is deprived in only one of these dimensions, the second person in two dimensions, and the third person is deprived in all three of these dimensions, indicating whether they're multidimensionally poor or not. In order to do this, we have to have some dimensional cutoff some fraction of deprivations that the person has to have in order to be deemed in this analysis to be multidimensionally poor. I said the UN uses a value of 0.3. I'm going to make things simple and I'll just say a value of a half. So we have a dimension cut off, let's abbreviate it this way, and it's equal to 0.5. Now we have all the information that we need to calculate the multidimensional poverty index because, again, it's just H times A, the fraction who are poor times the average intensity of the deprivations of those who are poor. So first of all, with a cutoff of 0.5, we can see this person is not multidimensionally poor because they're deprived in only a third of the weighted indicators. However, these two people are. This person is two-thirds deprived, and this person, if you want, is three-thirds deprived. But in any case, overall, two-thirds of the people are deprived, so that when we look at our MPI, which is H times A, we can start by seeing that the head count is equal to two-thirds. Two out of three people are deprived. Now, in computing the average intensity of deprivations, we don't look at this first person at all because they're not deemed multidimensionally poor. We want to find out how deprived, on average, are these two people who are multidimensionally poor. And so, therefore, we have the average of two-thirds deprived and three-thirds, or completely deprived, which is five-sixths deprived. So our value of A is equal to 5 over 6, which is just equal also to the sum of 2 thirds plus 1 divided by 2 for the overall average. So then, H times A, our multidimensional poverty indicator, is now equal to 2 thirds times 5 sixths 
which is equal to 5 ninths. Or, I think this is just equal to 0.5 bar. In other words, 0.5555. So that this is a very high number, in fact. This would rate it among the most poor countries in the world. So this gives you a simple illustration of how you can calculate the MPI and see its underlying assumptions and how this works. And there's an example of this with just a little bit more information, something like four dimensions and five people in the exercise set. So you'll get just a bit of practice for this. And for additional practice, you can try out different numbers and make sure it all makes sense to you. Now, this is just a number. Do you really get anything out of this? Why not just look at income poverty? Isn't it pretty much just the same thing? Well, it is not because, first of all, we know that income poverty is not enough if our concern is multidimensional poverty. This is already true conceptually since we want to understand and do understand poverty in a capabilities to function framework. But it turns out when you actually go to the data, you find that multidimensionally Bangladesh is substantially less poor than you would predict from its income poverty. And in contrast, Pakistan turns out to be substantially poorer than you would predict by its income poverty. I think that this is mentioned in the case study at the end of chapter one, but whether or not you can see from the overall picture that was presented in that case study comparing Bangladesh with Pakistan, that this is likely to have been the case. Now we find that Ethiopia is far more multidimensionally poor than predicted by income poverty. But Tanzania is much less so than would be predicted by income poverty. So we learn something about differences across countries. That's part of why it's important to do this kind of analysis. Namely, we learn something new. So it's not just that it fits more nicely with our overall framework, that's beneficial. This is a better way of depicting capabilities to function deprivation than is income loss. However, it is telling us more as well. Finally, most Latin American countries, such as Brazil, rank worse on multidimensional poverty than they do on income poverty. An exception is Colombia. Here's some data from a relatively recent year. This is not the MPI, it, this is H. It is the fraction of those who are multidimensionally poor in each of these countries. Now, there's no way that you can read this, of course, on, these sli on this slide. On the screen here, I think even if you zoom in, however, you have the slides and you can see them there. This tells us a ranking of countries based on the fraction poor, starting with zero to the most poor countries in the world in a multidimensional sense. Niger has nearly 90% of its people living in multidimensional poverty. So you can see that there's an enormous variation in multidimensional poverty among countries that are considered those in the developing world. Although some on the left there, the very left with zero poverty, actually have, for the most part, though not all, crossed the high income threshold. And Slovenia is there, but you cannot see it. That's such an example. But also with zero poverty are Belarus and Serbia. It's quite a few countries, as you can see, have at least half of their people living in multidimensional poverty, and a fair number, several, have two-thirds of their people or more living in multidimensional poverty. Here we can see some variations in the multidimensional poverty and the income poverty. We are looking at the fraction of those living on less than $2 a day. So first of all, there's a lot of variation. And second, there's not a clear correlation between income poverty and multidimensional poverty. It's not like overall you can just predict how much multidimensional poverty there will be and in proportional terms do so um, just by looking at income poverty. And that's the main point to get across there. Finally, just very briefly, this is another slide. I won't go into the details, but these are different regions within one country, Cameroon. And so depending upon the um, region that you're talking about, intensity of poverty can be greatly 
different. So it's not just a matter of looking at the fraction who are poor, but among those who are poor, in different regions, you find intensity of poverty to differ substantially. And so on that note, I'll conclude this episode.